Welcome to the respiratory system, the conducting zone. The respiratory system provides for exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide to and from the blood. Respiratory organs include the lungs and a branching system of bronchial tubes that link the sites of gas exchange with the external environment. Functionally, the system has two components, the conducting portion or zone and the respiratory portion or zone. This tutorial will take us through the histology of the conducting zone. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, the histology wizard. Let's take a minute to look at the big picture. The major function of the respiratory system is to supply the body with oxygen and dispose of carbon dioxide. To accomplish this function, several processes must occur, and the first two occur in the respiratory system. The first, pulmonary ventilation, is the movement of air in and out of the lungs, done by the conducting zone. The second is external respiration, or the movement of oxygen from the lungs to the blood and of carbon dioxide from the blood to the lungs, done by the respiratory zone. Third, the oxygen is transported from the lungs to the tissues of the body and carbon dioxide from the tissues to the lungs. Finally, we have the process of internal respiration, the movement of oxygen from blood to tissues and carbon dioxide from tissues to blood. The respiratory system has other critical functions including regulation of blood pH, olfaction, voice production, and protection. It also converts angiotensin I to II, which is an important vasoconstrictor. Anatomically, the respiratory system can be divided into the upper and lower respiratory tracts. The upper respiratory tract consists primarily of the nasal cavities and paranasal sinuses and the nasopharynx. The lower respiratory tract consists of the larynx, trachea, and within the lungs, the bronchi, bronchioles, and alveoli. Note the changing functions as we move from upper respiratory tract to lower, from purification and protection to detoxification and gas exchange. Histologically and functionally, the respiratory system has two components, the conducting zone, which contains all of the elements that condition air and bring it into the lungs, and the respiratory zone, where gas exchange actually occurs. The first portion of the conducting zone is the upper respiratory tract, which consists of the nasal cavities, the paranasal sinuses, and the nasal pharynx, whose main functions are olfaction, to warm and humidify inspired air, and protection, removing and trapping pathogens and particulate matter. These regions have a mucosa that contains pseudostratified ciliated columnar, or respiratory epithelium, except for portions of the nasal cavities which have olfactory epithelium. We'll cover olfaction later in the unit, including the special properties of olfactory epithelium. The larynx, which we will not cover here, is also part of the upper respiratory tract, and its main functions are to produce sound and to close the trachea during swallowing to prevent food and saliva from entering the airway. Much of the larynx contains respiratory epithelium, except for the true vocal cords, which are lined with stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium to protect against abrasion and desiccation from air movements. The second portion of the conducting zone consists of the trachea, bronchi, and the bronchioles, through the terminal bronchioles. We will walk through each component of the conducting zone, paying particular attention to the special features that define each component, including changes in the mucosa and epithelium that allow for the changing functions as we move deeper into the respiratory tree. We'll start with the major segment of the conducting region, the trachea, which is continuous with the larynx and ends at the carina. Let's take a cross-section through the trachea and look at its components. First, we'll talk about the mucosa. In the respiratory system, the mucosa or mucosal layer consists of two sublayers, the epithelium and the lamina propria, directly beneath it. In the trachea, the epithelium consists of pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium or respiratory epithelium. The connective tissue underlying the epithelium of the respiratory, digestive, and urinary systems is called the lamina propria. The lamina propria of the trachea and the next layer called the submucosa contain elastic fibers, special serum mucus glands, and C-shaped cartilage rings. The outermost layer is the tunica adventitia, which is a connective tissue layer. We will now discuss the features and roles of each of these layers one by one. First, we'll discuss the components of the tracheal mucosa or epithelium. Numerous types of cells can be identified in tracheal mucosa, but there are three major cell types, each comprising around 30%. Mucus goblet cells shown here are non-ciliated cells that are in contact with the basal lamina and the lumen. 
They produce mucins, which are released by exocytosis into the lumen and form part of the protective mucus gel layer that lines airways. They are readily identifiable by their shape and contents. Next, we see basal cells, the short cells that rest on the basal lamina but do not reach the lumen. These are the epithelial stem cells. The ciliated columnar cells, identified by brush-like tops at the lumen, move mucus and foreign particles towards the larynx and pharynx out of the body. There are other cell types, the most important of which are the cells that are part of the diffuse neuroendocrine system, cells that have neuroendocrine functions and secrete hormones such as serotonin and antidiuretic hormone, among others. However, these can't be distinguished with H&E staining. The lamina propria or submucosa contains seromucous glands. As is common in histology, it's often hard to determine the actual border of lamina propria versus submucosa. So you will find that some texts will say that the glands are found in the lamina propria, while others will say the submucosa. For our purposes, we'll just say both are correct and focus on the function. These glands are mixed glands, and they contain mucus cells that produce some components of airway mucus that trap particles, and the serous glands which produce a thinner, watery substance that helps humidify the air. This helps to keep the lungs free of particles and bacteria. Speaking of mucus, what exactly is airway mucus and what does it do? The airway mucus serves to trap things we don't want in the lungs, pathogens and particles, anything that might interfere with respiration, gas exchange, or promote infection. Thus, most common diseases have some defect in mucus, either too much mucus or an inability to move mucus properly. Most of the mucus is water, and it's the amount of hydration that determines the viscosity and elastic properties of the mucus. Thus, as we've seen previously, loss of water in the airway lumens of cystic fibrosis patients leads to an inability to clear pathogens and particles, which leads to infections. The other components contribute to the gel layer of the mucus. Mucins are glycoproteins that bind copious amounts of water and so allow the mucus to act as a lubricant and maintain low viscosity and elasticity. These and the other components are continuously replaced as the gel layer, again critical for trapping particles and pathogens. It also has other protective functions. The cilia in the periciliary layer beat and sweep. Starting in the bronchioles, the ciliated epithelial cells and the mucus work together to sweep pathogens and particulate matter toward the mouth and the nose. This is often called the mucociliary escalator or transport system. Here I've provided a link to a fun YouTube video that shows how this escalator might work. The escalator only moves in one direction, and so you can appreciate that if the escalator stops moving, the lungs can't clear mucus, which could lead to different pathologies. You should be able to predict the consequences of loss or defects in any of these components of this transport system. Other structures critical to tracheal function are the C-shaped cartilage rings found between the submucosa and the adventitia. The framework of the trachea and the extrapulmonary bronchi consists of a stack of C-shaped hyaline cartilages, each surrounded by a fibroelastic layer that is contiguous with the perichondrium of the cartilage. The open part of each C-ring points posteriorly to the esophagus at the back of your trachea. So what exactly do these rings do? In a nutshell, these rings reinforce the tracheal wall and keep the tracheal lumen open. Thus, they are resistant to compression, but have enough elasticity so that the trachea can expand and lengthen during breathing, and narrow enough to allow the esophagus to stretch with the food bolus. Why do they need to be C-shaped? Again, this allows the trachea to be flexible. The next important feature of the trachea is the trachealis muscle. This is a bundle of smooth muscle that bridges the open end of the C-rings and is bounded by a sheet of fibroelastic tissue attached to the perichondrium. This muscle relaxes during swallowing to facilitate the passage of food by allowing the esophagus to bulge into the lumen of the trachea. The elastic layer prevents excessive distension. Under sympathetic control, the trachealis will also relax, allowing dilation of the trachea to increase the respiratory rate. Think the fight or flight response. The muscle strongly contracts in the cough reflex to narrow the tracheal lumen, allowing for increased velocity of the expelled air and better loosening of material in the airway. Constriction of the trachea is under parasympathetic vagus control to force the air out of the airway. Now let's move further down the conducting zone into the bronchi. At the carina, the trachea branches into the right and left primary bronchi, 
which enter the hilium of each lung, where the pulmonary artery, vein, nerves, and lymphatics also enter the lung. Secondary divisions of each bronchi divide the lungs into lobes. Subsequent bronchial divisions further subdivide the lung into bronchopulmonary segments, each of which covers approximately 10 to 12 percent of each lung. The mucosa of the larger bronchi is very similar to the tracheal mucosa. As the bronchial size decreases, the epithelium transitions to simple columna. The organization of smooth muscle and cartilage changes in the bronchi. In the primary bronchi, the cartilage rings completely encircle the lumen as in the trachea, but as the bronchial diameter decreases, the cartilage rings are replaced with smaller isolated plates of hyaline cartilage. Small mucus and serous glands are still abundant. The lamina propria now contains crisscrossing bundles of spirally arranged smooth muscle, which become more and more prominent in the smaller bronchi. Contraction of this smooth muscle layer is responsible for the folded appearance of the bronchial mucosa, often seen in our histological sections, and is seen in this section here. Stimulation of the vagus produces contraction of the smooth muscle, while stimulation of the sympathetics inhibits contraction. As the bronchi decrease in size, there is also a progressive increase in elastic fibers. And you can quite clearly see these muscle fibers, or muscle bundles, and elastic fibers in this image of a bronchus stained with Mallory Azen stain, which stains them dark red and stains the cartilage plates dark blue. Here's a quick review of the changes that occur as we progress deeper into the conducting zone. Cartilage glands and goblet cells decrease, as does the height of the epithelial cells. Conversely, the relative amount of smooth muscle and elastic tissue increases. One structure we haven't mentioned yet is vault or malt which stands for bronchus-associated or mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue. Numerous lymphocytes are located within the lamina propria or among the epithelial cells. Lymphatic nodules may also be present. This tissue becomes relatively more abundant as bronchi become smaller and cartilage and other connective tissues are reduced. Tertiary bronchi of the bronchopulmonary segments give rise to smaller and smaller bronchi, whose terminal branches are called bronchioles. Bronchioles are the intralobular airways with diameters of one millimeter or less. Continuing the pattern described previously, cartilage decreases until it disappears. So this is an easy way to distinguish a large bronchial from a small bronchus, to look for the absence of cartilage plates. Again, the smooth muscle increases relative to the diameter of the lumen. Bronchioles also lack glands, and the epithelium lacks goblet cells for the most part. The epithelium decreases in height and complexity to become ciliated simple columnar or simply cuboidal in the smallest terminal bronchioles. Bronchioles are where the mucociliary escalator begins. These histological sections show the progressive changes in the epithelium, from respiratory epithelium with numerous cilia, to shorter more simple columnar with shorter and fewer cilia, to even shorter simple columnar epithelium lacking cilia. Here's another review image that summarizes the structural changes that occur as we move down the conducting zone from the trachea to the bronchi to the bronchioles. The smallest bronchioles are the terminal bronchioles, which mark the end of conduction. The terminal bronchial and the associated region of the pulmonary tissues that it supplies constitutes a pulmonary lobule. The terminal bronchial contains elastic fibers and smooth muscle, whose contraction is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. These bronchioles have simple cuboidal epithelium and lack goblet cells. The epithelium contains mostly club cells or bronchiolar exocrine cells. You might see these referred to in older texts or on the internet as Clara cells, but this name is no longer in use as of 2014 when they underwent a name change to club cells. This is because Max Clara, for whom these cells were named, was a Nazi anatomist who discovered these cells by experimenting on murdered prisoners from concentration camps during World War II. Clearly, these actions are deeply antithetical to the values of modern medicine. Back to club cells. These cells are club-shaped, non-ciliated, although they do contain microvilli. They are bronchiolar exocrine cells that are unique to bronchioles. Their major function is protective. They have a variety of critical functions. They secrete antimicrobial enzymes for local immune defense. They contain P450 enzymes that break down inhaled toxins. They also secrete the lining of the bronchioles, which includes glycosaminoglycans, and proteins similar to surfactant 
that help reduce surface tension. After airway injury, club cells also serve as stem cells, regenerating the bronchiolar epithelium and even migrating to replenish alveolar epithelial cells. At the EM level, the dome-shaped apical region of the club cells contains many secretory granules, mitochondria, and numerous vesicles. I'll end here with another review slide. This one summarizes the structural changes that we can observe histologically as we move down the bronchial tree. You should know these differences as it will help you distinguish among the different components of the conducting zone in the lab. We've now traveled from the nose to the beginning of the pulmonary lobule, which includes the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, and the alveoli. So we'll stop here and explore the respiratory zone of the respiratory system in the next tutorial. Thanks for stopping by.